by of course acknowledging that we are meeting today on Aboriginal land. Um, and given that we are talking today about gender and poverty, it's important to recognise that there is no group of women uh, at greater risk of poverty in this country than Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women. But also to recognise the great strength in Aboriginal women's leadership around the country, both at the local community level, at the state territory, um, and also at the national level. I think this event is in belated celebration of International Women's Day, um, hence the, the topic for today around gender and poverty. Um, and I just also wanted to start for those who don't know a lot about ACOS's role. Um, we are the peak body nationally for the community services sector, uh, and we are also the national voice for the needs of people on low incomes. Um, and my role there is as Director of Policy, so I work closely with uh, Dr Cassandra Goldie, who is the CEO, um, Deputy CEO uh, Tessa Boyd-Kane and Senior Advisor Peter Davidson, um, coordinating our policy work across a whole range of different areas, from social security, housing, tax reform, employment um, and so on. So to start with the big picture, in terms of what I want to cover today, I wanted to start um, with some of the boring statistics for you, but I don't, they're actually not that boring. They're, they're fairly stark on gender, poverty and inequality in this country. And then talk through some of the drivers of poverty in Australia, looking at the employment market and employment policy settings, at social security policy settings, at childcare policy settings, and finally, um, turning to some of the opportunities and the risks, I guess, um, particularly in the current environment, um, focusing on the government's um, current development of a new package for families and its focus on increasing women's participation in, the, in employment, in paid employment, I should say. And, and finally, I want to talk a little bit about tax reform because, of course, it raises the question of, of how we pay for um, the services and supports that we need to address poverty being experienced by everyone, but particularly by women, um, and the need to bring some women's voices um, into that debate. Just a note on framing, I just wanted to say at the outset um, that I'm very aware that, that including families and childcare policy within the context of a discussion about gender and poverty uh, in a way reinforces women's primary caring role. And, and that's not to suggest in any way that we don't need to radically think the current division of labour between men and women, both in the paid workforce um, and on the home front. The facts on gender, poverty and inequality. So no surprises that women are um, at significantly higher risk of poverty than men are. So the most recent ACOS Poverty in Australia report um, highlights that 14.7% of women in, uh, in Australia are living in poverty compared to 13% of men. And we know that there are some key groups who are at particular risk. And sole parents are the group of women who are arguably most at risk in a, in a general sense of poverty, with 33% of sole parents in Australia experiencing poverty. So it's a third. And a lot of them are concentrated at the very bottom of the income spectrum. So more than 70% in the bottom 20% of incomes. When you ask parents, sole parents who are on the parenting payment single, which is the, the pension payment that some sole parents with younger children receive, 56% of them describe themselves as poor. 58% um, experience what we call multiple deprivation, which means that they have to go without three or more of the things that the general Australian community regard as essential for a basic standard of living. Um, I, I just want to note that I haven't included data in this slide on uh, women and inequality, but I did want to say that ACOS is, and I was just mentioning this to Livia, producing a report on inequality in Australia. It will be the first such report that we have done. We've been doing a series of poverty in Australia reports over the last few years. I think we released our third of those reports last year. And we've been very keen to expand that research agenda to also address um, poverty. So the first of those reports will be launched in June at our national conference. And that will give us um, a deeper, more detailed story um, about what's going on in terms of income and wealth, importantly, uh, inequality. And there's a very gendered nature to wealth inequality in particular. Obviously, we know we hear a lot about income inequality between men and women. We hear less about wealth inequality. And I'm expecting we'll have some more to say um, about that in June. So it might be a good future conversation uh, topic. Um, 
I'm going to focus a lot of my remarks today on, on the situation being faced by single parents who are mostly women, um, because as I said, they really are the group of women who are most at risk of poverty um, in Australia. But in doing that, I didn't want to um, suggest that there are not other groups of women who are also at significantly high risk. We've mentioned Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women who will be dis disproportionately represented <coughs> in that single mums group anyway. Um, but there are a number of other groups that it's important to have on the radar. One is older women who don't own their own home. And we're seeing um, it's, um, an increasing incidence of older women experiencing homelessness. You've probably heard about that here before. Um, and more and more women are having to be, will be forced to rely on the aged pension um, whilst also facing the costs of private rental as they've either fallen out of home ownership through marriage breakdown or never been able to get into it, which is going to be increasingly the mm. case with housing unaffordability um, at the crisis levels that it is. So that's a, that is a key group of concern for us. Women with disabilities, of course, um, the level of multiple deprivation um, amongst people with disabilities is, is, is also very high. There are high costs associated with having a disability, let alone the income poverty that people are likely to experience because of the barriers to work. Um, and I think increasingly young women at a time of very high <coughs> youth unemployment at 20 to 30% in some parts of the country um, and some current proposals on the table from this government to cut young people off payments for six months of every year inevitably will affect um, young women but also of course young men. Um, so, I mean, the other reason that I'm focusing on the sole parent group is because there are some very clear and direct impacts on child poverty. That in Australia, that is where child poverty is concentrated, is in, is in single mum, single, single parent families, mostly, mostly mothers. So, the drivers of poverty um, amongst women in Australia. Now, the first of those is barriers to employment. We have comparatively, um, particularly to other OECD countries, fairly low levels of female workforce participation overall. But we have particularly high, quite, quite starkly um, higher rates of joblessness um, in sole parent households. More than 50% of single parent households in Australia are not in paid work. And when you have about one in five children living in single parent households, that's contributing to that very high rate of child poverty that we see in Australia. And part of that is cultural. So compared to other countries, the Australian division of labour within families, we still adhere very largely to the, the male as primary breadwinner um, model. And Annabel Crabbe talks a lot about that in her book. Um, and in that, we have fallen behind the trends in other OECD countries, particularly those in Northern Europe, um, where there's been much stronger support for men's increased caring roles in the home. Um, through policies like, interestingly, compulsory paternal leave, um, so that men are forced to take a several months off when, when children are born. And it really does change the trajectory um, over the long term, um, as the research shows, in terms of how hands-on they are, how many hours a week they spend um, in, in um, caring for their children at home and in other aspects of domestic work. <coughs> Um, but it's also because the funding in Australia for early childhood education and care services falls well below the OECD average. Um, and I don't know if some of you might have heard, and I'll talk more about this this morning, um, the radio interview this morning on Life Matters with a childcare expert talking about that, how low our level of uh, investment is, and that countries like China have recently recognised how critical that early childhood education and care is um, to future productivity, economic growth, um, and all of those, um, all of those things, and so are increasing their um, investment as a ratio of GDP. Australia is yet to do that, but we'll talk more about what might be on the agenda. Um, the number of single parent families in Australia is also projected to increase, um, which is likely to mean, unless we radically change current policy settings around employment um, and around social security, that we will see an increase in poverty amongst both those women <coughs> households and their children. Um, of course, the other key issue so is the barriers to work. So caring is a barrier to work only if the system doesn't support you in that caring role, um, and that's partly about childcare, which I'll come to. Um, it's also about the lack of part-time employment opportunities for women. We've seen the casualisation of labour, but that doesn't necessarily mean that there's an increase in part-time, stable and secure employment opportunities um, that women are able to participate in and also manage um, other responsibilities. Um, and we have, yeah, and we also have amongst that, particularly that single parent group, limited educational qualifications. 
the vast majority of sole parents we know would much prefer to be engaging in some kind of paid work to the extent that they can manage that with the care of their children than relying exclusively on income support. But the systems just aren't there to support that. Um, and in particular, the employment services system is letting down single mums. Jobs um, services providers' assistance to long-term unemployed people, which is often that single parent group, is pretty limited. It's typically an interview once every two months and $500 for the provider to use to support um, that person with training and other costs. I mean, it's a pittance. Um, a few uh, single parents receive what we could accurately describe as career counselling, which is one of um, the, the key um, elements in, in transitioning to employment and for many a really necessary first step. And although single parents particularly benefit from vocational training, and many of them are really keen to get that training, um, those on income support have a lot of difficulty meeting the costs of fees. Um, and the training that they do get is often poorly connected to the employment opportunities in the area, and we've heard quite a bit about that disconnect from the likes of people like Andrew Forrest in other contexts and also McClure. So I think there's a broad recognition that that's a problem, perhaps less consensus about what the solutions might be. <coughs> So given um, the challenges of securing paid employment, it means that, that many single parents um, are relying instead on income support. And the key payments are the sole parent pension for those with younger children under age eight, um, and increasingly for many women, the New Start allowance, which as you all know, ACOS has been banging on for years and years and years, like a broken record, is simply not adequate. I think it's now $37 a day. So it's gone up from 35, but that's over a few years. It's two dollars extra. It's still a pittance. Um, the sole parent pension. One of Whitlam's great legacies was introducing um, the, the, the payment specific pension for um, single parents. And for a long time, the, the level of payment received by single parents was pegged at the same um, level as that received by age pensioners, disability support pensioners, and others. But that link has been broken really in the last 10 years and I'll talk a little bit more about that because what that has meant has been a very significant um, impact on poverty in single parent families and therefore child poverty. The other part of the social security system that's really important for single uh, parents is of course the family payment system. So family tax benefit part A and part B, I won't go into all of that or you all fall asleep, um, but needless to say those payments are not adequate, particularly for low income women. Um, and there's some poorly targeted, um, some, some aspects of the payments are poorly targeted. Um, and they don't recognise that the cost of children increase as children get older. And instead, the level of um, assistance to parents um, um, decreases through the family payment system. So when we come to talk about um, the development of this new families package by the government, one of the key objectives that we'll be seeking in that package is more support for sole parents to address um, the poverty experienced by those women and their children. Um, and then I've just completely lost my train of thought what the other thing was, which was, oh, that's right, cost, increasing assistance for the cost of older children. It's the other key objective there. So originally, um, the, the pen, what's it called? The parenting payment single, and that is the pension payment, was received by, went to sole parents with children up to the age of 18 years, and that, that age has gradually been brought down. Now, that's quite consistent um, with what's happened in other countries. The key thing for us is we, we think it's reasonable to impose obligations on women, um, single parents, to look for work and so on once their children are, not, are out of those really early years. But that doesn't justify cutting payment levels when we know that the costs of children increase. So they should be two different questions. If you want to get women into work, um, sure, increase employment services and supports, improve access to training, provide childcare. That's the way to do that, not by increasing poverty and therefore trying to effectively force people um, into work through the financial pressures that, that are involved in that. So I won't go through all of this in detail, but I mean the broad picture is that we've basically had a series of decisions. It's important to say by both major parties. So this is not, there's no one particular party that, um, that has uh, um, led the charge on eroding uh, support for sole parents. Howard, um, I suppose the, the big shift began in the Howard years with the welfare to work policies. Um, and that was an interesting combination of cutting payments for single parents who were moved off 
pensions, those with children over eight years of age, moved off the pension payment and onto the lower New Start allowance. That's now a gap of $160 a week. It's a very significant gap. Um, then in 2009, the, the Labor government delivered a $30 a week increase to age pensioners and other pensioners, which was fantastic. And we saw, as a result of that, a reduction in poverty amongst older people. But they excluded sole parents from it. And this, what we see is this constant, um, repeated singling out of sole parents for different and lesser treatment than other pension recipients, which we think is unfair. And we're seeing that again at the moment, I have to say, we'll jump forward, jumping forward a little um, with the current debate about pension indexation. Now, ACOS clearly opposes any move to change the way that we index pensions, and, and, and the government's proposal is to, instead of linking pensions to both growth in wages and prices, whichever is highest, which is what currently happens, moving on to a prices only model of indexation. And what we've seen over the last 20 years or so, which explains why the, new, the gap between the pension and the new start payment has gone from about 30 or $40 a week to $160, is because of the different way they're indexed. New starts just to prices, pensions to wages and prices. And the graph is like that over time. Um, and so, and clearly the government's seeing this as a savings measure. So we're hearing a lot of um, debate about this measure. There's very strong opposition um, to it from broad sectors of the community and the ALP, which is fantastic. And everyone is talking about age pensioners, and that's really important. But no one's mentioning sole parents. And actually, the measure would, in fact, introduce a lower rate of indexation for them earlier than the other groups. So that in the budget papers, the idea was that the sole parents would be moved on to a lower rate of indexation from July last year other pensioners not until 2017. Now that was a clever stunt to avoid breaking an election promise, but it's also completely consistent with this history of singling out of sole parents for different and lesser treatment. So I think it's important to keep that in mind in this current debate about indexation, that it's not just about age pensioners as important as that group are and as at risk of poverty as that group are too. It's about people on disability support pension and it's about um, sole parents. So in what, what the Gillard and um, Rudd governments then did after that was the original group in the welfare to work policy who were already on the higher level of payment were grandfathered, so protected from that shift over to New Start. Labor decided to end the grandfathering arrangement. So that's what happened in 2011. Another cohort of sole parents effectively was shifted onto, off the pension and onto the New Start, so losing. At that time it was probably $150 a week or something. In 2012, in response to that decision, and I guess that pattern of decisions, the UN Human Rights Council expressed concern about that move to um, moving sole parents onto lower payments. And I've just mentioned the indexation change from last year, which came in the context of a whole lot of other cuts too, um, which I'll talk about in a minute, many of them affecting um, single mums particularly. And we are just in the process now of, a, of being about to lodge another complaint um, with the UN Human Rights Council um, on this issue uh, because the pattern's continuing and, and is only making the situation worse. Keeping in mind that those measures, of course, have not been passed from last year's budget, thanks to the colourful crossbench who've, um, <laughs> who've been yeah, holding the line, I have to say, very strongly on this, which... And, and some of them have come out specifically on sole parents. Clive Palmer, would you believe, has been a champion of, of single mums. Um, so there's been some real surprises, I think, in how the politics of this are unfolding. Um, one thing I thought was interesting last year is that we saw a lot of analysis about the impact of the budget um, from an equity perspective and ACOS played a lead role in that, but NatSEM did some fantastic modelling in Canberra um, of the distributional effects of budget measures and, and different income groups and where they were going to end up. Um, but no one's doing any gender analysis of the budget, so I think that's an interesting challenge that someone might want to take up, but it'd be great after each budget to see someone do a really detailed analysis of what, what, the, what the upshot of all of that is going to be and the differential impact on men and women, particularly lower income women. Um, so, as I said, there were a range of changes in last year's budget which will increase poverty amongst low-income women um, if implemented, the indexation, the restriction of family payments um, to families with younger children, which will be a $44 a week cut to single-parent families. Now, that's despite the fact, as I said, that the costs of children increase as children get older. So, um, there's no logic to that measure. Cuts, so JET is a um, childcare um, program that provides 
assistance to very low income um, families who are on income support. Many sole parents relied on that program. And likewise, the pensioner education supplements. So there's a whole package of measures that in, in total will have a very um, severe impact on single mums. So the other factor in the mix is obviously the McClure review of welfare. Um, and the final report was released in the last month or so. And there were a number of proposals in that which, which raised some red flags for us around single parents. Um, now, there's some good things in McClure, um, but we think it didn't go far enough in terms of trying to simplify the system or address the adequacy question directly enough. It kind of skirted around that issue. Um, but what it has proposed is that instead of just having the one new start payment of $37 a day, there would be a tiered payment um, of different levels depending on your capacity to work. Uh, and it would mean that some of those people who are currently on New Start, who face, who have ex various um, disadvantages and barriers to work, would get possibly a higher rate of payment each week. Although McClure didn't say what the levels of any of these payments should be, so that's the big caveat here. It's very hard to assess the impact of these proposals. But it also suggested. Um, so, so, sorry, that would include some single parents who are currently on New Start, have barriers to work and therefore might move up into the second tier or third tier of the, of the New Start tiered payment. Um, but it suggested getting rid of the single parent pension. Um, and so for those uh, single parents with younger children, that would be a clear and severe cut if the payment levels remained as they are, which again McClure didn't address. So just wanted to flag that, was, that is an area of anxiety. So we'll be watching that closely. Um, also important to say that the Minister has identified, I think, three different cohorts that are his priority cohorts, the new Minister Morrison, um, in developing his welfare reform agenda. Single parents are one of his priority cohorts, which could either be really great or really not great, <laughs> depending on what he decides to do with that agenda. Uh, but older people um, getting back into the workforce is, is another priority, um, and young unemployed males specifically. So in terms of the other key plank, and keeping in mind all those caveats at the beginning, um, childcare policy is the other key area that we need to examine um, if we are to increase women's workforce participation um, and also reduce, therefore, women's poverty. Um, so as I said, we've got a lower level of investment in early childhood education and care than the OECD average. Um, and we currently have a pretty complex and inequitable but expensive childcare system, I expensive for what it delivers. Um, it's designed in a way that delivers greater assistance to higher income families than it does for lower income families, and it's a desi designed in a way that drives up fees, so that it has an inflationary impact. So we certainly support the call for reform of the childcare system, um, and, but we do think that, that in terms of its objectives, we need to balance this, this objective around women's workforce participation, which is what the government's been talking a lot about. The government's not been saying anything about quality educational outcomes for children. And those, t those key priorities need to be equally important in this process. Um, otherwise, we're not getting bang for buck in terms of investment and we're not delivering the outcomes that we need for children in terms of lifelong learning. Um, and so one of the key objectives is to increase assistance to very low income families. We do support though a universal subsidy. So this is one area where ACOS perhaps surprisingly isn't out there advocating for strict means testing. We think that early childhood education and care should be a universal service. It should be part of the broader education system. And I think the failure of us to think about childcare in that way has been one of the things that's kept us back um, in terms of educational outcome and, and also women's participation. Um, but we do think it should be tiered so that lower income families get a higher level of subsidy. It tapers out for higher income families with a base level of payment, a minimum payment that all households should receive. The government has committed to developing a new package for families. I think it's going to be one of the key um, new policies announced either in the lead up to the budget, but certainly part of the budget on budget night, um, along with the small business tax package. Um, and what else is on the table? I think those are the two main things. Um, it's a really good thing that families policy um, is in focus and that we're having a debate about childcare. 
the question is where it's all going to go and what the outcomes of that reform process are going to be. And as I said, balancing those important objectives, including ensuring that we achieve both economic equity and also greater gender equity um, as a part of the package. One of the key issues for us is going to be the engagement process in developing the package, and that has been a cause for concern. I've made repeated calls to the Minister's office over the last week to try and find out whether there is some kind of engagement mechanism. We'd heard rumours of an advisory body being established, but no one no, seems to know any more about that. Um, what we don't want to see is the government announce something without having talked to anybody, and that's the mistake that they made last year um, in the budget, and it's bedeviled them ever since. So I think it would be um, very sensible of them to engage closely with experts in the community um, in, in shaping this policy. But so far the signs haven't been encouraging on that, I have to say. And the time is ticking because this is the last parliamentary sitting week before the budget um, and they're going to want to announce something, I think, before budget night. So, and it's complex. It's a complex area of policy. Um, it's really important that we don't see a debate that stigmatises different, different kinds of women, professional women. Um, you know, we've heard a lot of pretty nasty rhetoric, I have to say, in the context of the paid parental leave debate about North Shore little lawyers or little solicitors, which I just think is pejorative and unhelpful. Um, at the same time, we don't want to see a stigmatisation of single mums who are out of work and relying on welfare. So uh, it's a debate that needs to be, I think, um, really carefully um, thought through and articulated. Okay. Um, and we needed to package onto the, onto the controversial nannies question, um, which is obviously something the government's seriously thinking about, but that delivers flexibility for those who need it and all of those who need it, not just high-income households um, who can afford in-home care. Um, but we also need to recognise that quality care for children is probably best delivered through centre-based care, which has better resources, um, is better regulated, you've got accredited staff who are trained properly. Um, so that any move towards nannies, although it's not something ACOS opposes, we would say it needs to be very carefully considered to ensure that, that A, the benefits are not only enjoyed by a very small group of high-income households, um, and also that we ensure quality for children so that we're still getting the educational outcomes for kids. It's not just babysitting at home um, through accreditation, through regulation. And I would suggest ideally through a relationship with a centre-based provider, which is what happens in New Zealand. So it's an interesting model where nannies are affiliated with centres. And finally, tax reform. The most exciting part last. Um, I thought it would be, I don't know where anyone else saw it, but Philip Alston, who's the UN um, Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty, made a speech at the Christian Aid Conference in Dublin um, in February about tax reform and human rights. And we rarely hear human rights practitioners, advocates and lawyers talking about tax reform or economic policy, much to my frustration, um, and which really did inform my move from law to social policy, I have to say. Um, so it was really refreshing to hear Philip Alston talk about this important issue. And he wrote, there are always reasons why poverty can't be eliminated and why alternative projects need to take priority. The sanctity of tax policy is too often invoked as if there are no choices to be made. And on the, on the issue of choice, I think we've been given a very stark choice as women between having you know, what was it, the rolled gold paid parental leave scheme, which is not that exceptional by international comparison. The idea of having a wage replacement model um, of paid parental leave is a sound one. The question is how do you pay for it and, is, and what cost is borne by employers uh, and what cost by governments. Um, so we've been told we can't afford both. So women, you've got to choose. You can either have a better investment in your childcare system or you can have a wage-based paid parental leave, but you don't get both. And the media today confirmed that the government's planning to pay for this childcare reform um, agenda by redirecting the funds from the PPL scheme. So again, it's perhaps not surprising that women are being forced to make those choices or other people are making those choices for us, perhaps. Um, and there are choices to be made and there are other ways to achieve um, budget balance. Um, so I think it's also interesting to consider when you look at who's getting the benefit of the existing tax concessions, um, arguably wasteful tax expenditures, including superannuation tax expenditures um, and housing tax expenditures and tax concessions, 
that the beneficiaries are mainly high income men. Um, so I guess what I'm trying to say is that women really have an important stake in the tax reform debate. Um, and it's really important that women, including low income women, try and engage with it, um, even as complex as it can seem. And I think there are some vested interests that try and make the debate seem very complex too, to, um, to preserve their kind of domination over it. So it's important to try and break down some of that complexity and unpack um, some fundamentals about the tax system. Because we can afford to invest more um, in addressing poverty experienced by women and their children. Um, and so that participation is really important. So that's all I want to say. Thanks. Thank you.